Thank you, Mike. Thank you, praise team. Children, you are dismissed to junior worship. Would you all please stand with me and turn to the book of James chapter 2. James chapter 2. I'm reading this morning from the New American Standard Bible. This is straightforward, straight up, in your face, truth. And I love it about this man. James chapter 2. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who's wearing the fine clothes, and say, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What use is it, my brethren, if a man says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Our Lord, we do praise you this morning that you are a God of grace and mercy and you demonstrate that you reign as sovereign Lord who does as he pleases in that when you saved us, Lord, you saved not many mighty, not many wise. You saved the things which are not to shame the things that are. You picked in the exact opposite way that our world would pick when you picked us. And so we are amazed by your grace. And we thank you for your salvation of us through Christ. And all boasting is excluded. It's demolished. Except for boasting in you. We thank you for such grace, such wonderful salvation and demonstration of love to the unlovely. Thank you, Lord, that you've brought us near and made us your own through your son, Jesus Christ. And we as your sons and daughters worship you and praise you and rejoice to know that mercy triumphs over judgment, that you have pitied us and shown compassion and helped us through Christ and brought salvation to us and you've forgiven us by your grace. You've changed us and you sustain us by that same grace and we rejoice in your mercy. And we thank you today, Lord, that our faith is not mere words, 
but a faith that you have granted as a gift. When you caused us to be born again, you gave us that gift of faith in Christ. And we called on the name of the Lord and we were saved apart from works. But we rejoice to know, Lord, that when you give true faith, that faith demonstrates itself in works. That we were saved to good deeds. We were saved to walk in righteousness and thereby to follow in the footsteps of this great man, Abraham, and this godly woman that you transformed, Rahab. We rejoice in saving faith. We rejoice in faith that is lived out by your grace. And we now, Lord, as partakers of grace, we desire to hear your word, that you would nurture our faith, that you would strengthen us in our walks with Christ, that we would hear to obey and prove the reality of our faith through our works. And all this to the glory of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated this morning. I got to just tell you, uh, it was a a great week, an interesting week. Very briefly, I I knew I had jury duty on Tuesday. Where's Lauren Donahue? Lauren, where are you? She took off? Utah. Utah? Wait, didn't I just see Lauren up here? Lauren, I got to ask you if if you ended up having to serve on a jury. Lauren was just here. Oh, well. I, we were there the same day, all that to say. And um, I was one of the first ones called, one of the first ones in the jury box. I've never gotten that far. I thought, you know, they'll just, they'll, just, they'll just throw me out. I'm a pastor. You know, got to somewhat give my testimony even in that. Got picked for the jury, and uh, the, the judge actually said it was the quickest jury he has ever I mean, the quickest trial he's ever seen. You know, I thought, I'm going to be here through Friday. How am I going to get the study done? The men's group Friday morning. Praise God, we were done Wednesday afternoon. I was sorry for the woman that we had to try. We convicted her on three counts, and sadly, I was also the four-person, right? One of the guys looked across the table and said, Pastor, I'm sure you serve on all kinds of committees and stuff like that. Why don't you just do it? You know, and I look around. Does anybody else want to do this, you know? And the guy two down said, "Uh, yeah, I've done it twice. I don't want to do it. So, you know, you pray for these opportunities, and probably the highlight that I just wanted to share with you is a gal from the Philippines I met, and I could tell she was Filipina, and I did my one line, gusto ko matuto kamat nang balut, right? I want to learn to eat balut, and I know if they respond, they're Filipino and they speak Tagalog. And then we got talking, and, uh, and she said, why did you go to the Philippines? And I told her about the ministry of John MacArthur and Grace to You in 1986 and 87. She said, oh, I know about John MacArthur. And right there with the rest of the jury standing around, she just launches into her testimony about being saved out of Catholicism, you know, and following the living God and Jesus Christ. And then I got to respond with my testimony. It was great. I mean, we're talking across the hallway here and all sorts of people standing around. And that was really, really exciting for me. I didn't know what I was getting into. Never served on a jury, but God just gave that, and I wanted to share it with you. I bless him, too, that I'm here, and I was able to get some studying in this week. Didn't think I would. Didn't know how that was going to work out, but praise God for his grace and an opportunity to testify on behalf of Christ. Well, turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5 this morning. If you need a Bible, you can pick up one of those pew Bibles, and if you turn to page 960, you will find Matthew 5. And today, we're, we're looking at the sixth beatitude. And I got to tell you, with this sixth beatitude, we are coming now this morning to one of the greatest and most exciting teachings to be found anywhere in Scripture. On the one hand, when we study through this, you, like I, will probably feel very inadequate, rightly so. But simultaneously, I pray you would be encouraged and filled with hope from this great promise of our wonderful Lord Jesus Christ. So let me read all the Beatitudes to you, and then we'll focus in on verse 8 this morning. And when he, Jesus, saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and opening his mouth, he began to teach them, saying, I hope this is very familiar to you. I hope these Beatitudes are gripping you like they're gripping me. I can't remember the last study that I've done. I'm always trying to apply Scripture to myself, but this one has really gripped my heart. Blessed are the poor in spirit, 
for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's our beatitude for this morning. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward in heaven is great, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. For today then, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Let's begin with letter A, the focus. The focus. The heart of the matter is your heart. So let's begin with that word heart this morning. Jesus Christ is obviously concerned about our hearts. The gospel of Jesus Christ is focused on the heart. It's not enough for us to merely look good on the outside, to clean up our act on the outside, to look like we're holy and good people or maybe just kind of nice and polite people. Jesus Christ is not after the reformation of our manners this morning. He is after heart transformation, radical inner purity, purity of heart. The heart is utterly crucial to the Lord Jesus. So what is the heart? Maybe you haven't asked that question in a while. Maybe you've never really done that study. The answer is the heart is the real you. The heart is the the center of your personality, what you truly are on the inside. That's your heart, the real you. Sometimes, you know, the Bible uses the word heart to refer to our intellect, our thinking. Mark 2, 8. Why are you reasoning about these things in your heart? So the heart is where we think and ponder and reason and meditate, work things out, our intellect. But the heart can also refer to the emotions and the affections, how we feel, our moods, and significantly, what we love and what we hate. In John 14, 1, Jesus says, let not your what? Let not your heart be troubled. In Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 2, the king says, this is nothing but sadness of heart. And then in Mark 12 30, of course, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your what? With all of your heart. That's the first on the list. The heart also encompasses what we call the volitional function, the will, what you choose, what you intend to do. In Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, for example, Daniel, we read, made up his mind, literally, he set upon his heart not to defile himself with the king's unclean food. So he determined, he resolved as a course of action through an act of will, an act of will in his heart. And don't forget how the word of God is able to judge what the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Hebrews 4.12, we're going to come back to that. So if we put all of that together... The heart is really the inner man, the inner person with all of its many functions, intellect, emotions, affections, will. It is the command center of your life, the master control area of your entire existence. The heart is what you really are deep down in the secrecy of your thoughts and feelings and desires and loves and hates and commitments. When nobody else knows or sees except God, that's your heart. And way down deep there in those inner recesses, at those invisible roots of our actions and the external manifestations in our lives, God is concerned about what is happening way down there, what is there in your heart. Now, can we just remind ourselves this morning? Man, human beings, we look at the outward appearance, right? And I'm sure all of us spent time there this morning taking the shower, brushing the hair, you know, putting on our finest, whatever. Some of you, maybe not your finest. But man looks at the outward appearance, at the height of the stature and things like that. But God sees not as man sees because, remember, the Lord looks at the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7. So my question to you up front, how you doing there? 
way down deep there. How's your heart this morning? Where are you doing? How are you doing with your heart? How are you in that secret place that is only observed by God's all-penetrating gaze? He sees right into our hearts this morning. We can fool people, but God never. And sometimes we even fool and deceive ourselves, but not God. He sees us as we are. He's looking right into your heart and my heart this morning. He sees everything there and seeing it truly and rightly. So don't overlook the importance of the heart. I want you to get that up front this morning in our sermon. Don't minimize the heart. Proverbs 4.23, the writer Solomon says, watch over your heart with all diligence. Why, Solomon? For from it flow the springs of life. See, it's here in the heart that salvation is experienced, right? We confess with our mouth Jesus as Lord. We believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead to be saved, Romans 10, 9. The mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart, right? Matthew 12, 34. The heart is to be the center of our obedience and Christian living because Ephesians 6, 6 speaks of doing the will of God from the heart. And so the heart is extremely vital, and it is utterly crucial to the Lord Jesus. He says, blessed, happy, favored are the pure in heart. Now that's our problem too, isn't it? Our hearts. We've seen just now the heart described, but now we have to talk about the heart defiled. That's our problem. The heart is the center of your being and personality, and it's also always the hub of all your troubles. Where do they come from? Your heart, my heart. Now, I know we often are quick to blame others for our problems, even to blame God or to blame our circumstances for the wrong things that we do, but the real culprit in every case is our heart. The terrible fallacy The lie that's at the base of so much wrong thinking in our nation, we see it again and again, the wrong thinking, is that all of man's troubles really are due to his environment, his circumstances. And so the thinking goes, to change the person, you have to change the environment. And so we will spend trillions of dollars. We need to lift people out of poverty. We need to give them more opportunity, more education, and we will make them better. We will change them. How? How does salvation and transformation take place according to our world? Through the externals, through the circumstances. No mention of the heart. And, by the way, did you know government is the answer in that process? Little did you know government can come to the rescue and solve all of our problems by giving us more of these things we need, more education, more opportunity, and we say, that is wrong. It's all backwards. It's unbiblical. You see, you know that because Adam and Eve lived in a perfect environment. How'd that turn out, by the way? Horrible, exactly. They lived in a perfect environment, the paradise of the Garden of Eden, and they sinned. Putting people in perfect environments cannot save them. The problem is not our environment. It's not a lack of money or opportunity or education. It is not a need for more government. Government can't save you, please. The trouble is in the heart. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it, asks Jeremiah in chapter 17, verse 9. The problem is at the center, at the core of who we are. Our greatest problem is our wicked, sinful, deceptive hearts. And we can't fix that with money. We can't fix it with government. But that's where Jesus puts his finger, right there at the source of the problem. And let me show you this. We're in Matthew's gospel, so turn over to chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, and let me show you this, how Jesus fingers that very problem. He points to it. He underscores it. Matthew 12, verse 33, he's talking to the Pharisees, and he says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, 
Or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. And then here's Jesus winning friends and influencing people. You brood of vipers, you bunch of poisonous snakes. How can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. So Jesus says the nature determines the fruit, the product, words, actions. A good tree bears good fruit. A bad tree bears bad fruit. Evil hearts produce evil words. So how could the evil Pharisee speak what is good? It's impossible, in other words, because the sewage of the heart spills out of the mouth. That's what Jesus says. Now turn over with me to Matthew chapter 15, just a few verse, few chapters over to the right. Matthew 15, verse 17. Jesus again instructing, now Peter and the disciples. Externals versus heart. Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the what, everybody? Come from the heart, right? And those defile the man. Now, talk about a flattering picture for all of us. Here it is. For out of the heart come, you ready for this? Ooh, it's not that flattering. Evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. Again, Jesus says the heart is our problem. He did not come to reform some bad habits that need to be broken. He came to transform and radically fix our hearts. That's the fundamental core issue. Where does murder come from? Jesus says, it's not environment or lack of education or money. It's not from bad parenting or too little government. Note that. Out of the heart comes murder. Government can't fix that. Only God can. Unwed mothers, the breakdown of the family, divorce, theft, corruption. The government can't fix those problems. They are heart problems, according to verse 19. They need the Lord Jesus who came to seek and to save the lost. He came into the world to save sinners with hearts like that. People like me, people like you, all of us, apart from Christ, with dirty hearts that need radical heart surgery, that need radical heart transplants. And it is so obvious that the heart is the source of all of our trouble. And Jesus, God the Son, is our only hope, that Lord and Savior. The cure is not a natural one. It's supernatural. The the gospel, that's the answer for wicked-hearted people like me. The good news of the gospel the perfect-hearted, just, and holy Savior Jesus giving himself in death to rescue evil and impure-hearted sinners. That's what he came to do. And that is good news. Now, before we leave Matthew 15, I want you to see a problem that so easily takes our focus off of the heart where it should be. And here's the problem. A focus on Externals, a preoccupation with ceremony, ritual, the trappings of religion, even ceremonial purity that ignores internal purity, that ignores heart purity. Look at verse 17. It's a preoccupation with what you eat, what goes into the mouth, rather than what is coming out of the mouth from the heart, verse 18. Or verse 20 unwashed hands, that's the preoccupation, rather than holy hands, clean hands, and a pure heart. Look at verse 11 of chapter 15. Jesus says, not what enters into the mouth defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth, this defiles the man. The heart is the defiler. So look at the heart, not the externals. And look at verses 7 and 8. You hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching his doctrines, the precepts of men. God doesn't want mindless and heartless words. It's not okay if you can make people think you're spiritual or righteous, but you know you're not. It's not okay to play the part. 
God does not accept that. That was Phariseeism. As long as people think I'm spiritual, it doesn't matter what's going on on the inside. That is not biblical Christianity. God is after the heart. He wants our hearts. Not vain worship and human teachings that focus on externals that get substituted for his words focused on the heart. Now you remember so often Jesus reserved his harshest words for the Pharisees and this whole sinful, hypocritical focus by them on the externals, on ceremonial purity to the exclusion and even the displacement of heart purity. Listen, for example, to Matthew 23. You can turn there if you want. It's just a few pages over. But Matthew 23, again, in the gospel, in verse 23, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law. Well, what did you leave out? Oh, something as little as justice and mercy and faithfulness. You left those things out. You got all the herbs right. You got those wrong. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Is he not the master teacher? Is that not a a fitting and picturesque indictment of false religion? You strain out the gnat, but you open your mouth wide and you swallow a whole camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And then this is such a strong indictment. It's really a pretty disgusting picture. And Jesus, who sees the hearts, is the one who paints it. Look what he says. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Is it okay for us to appear on the outside to be spiritual? Are we okay in Christ as long as people think we're righteous? even if we're living an unrighteous, ungodly, unholy life? No. No. It's not okay. It's not acceptable. Jesus says, you hypocrites, you hypocrites, you hypocrites. Outwardly, you appear righteous. Inwardly, you're lawless fakers. Whitewashed tombs. You know, in in most cases... There's nothing more beautiful than a cemetery, right? We kind of laugh about this, right? You know, what do I want when I die? Well, I want to have a nice breeze, and you got to bury me next to a nice flowing river, and there's got to be a good view, right? I need all those things, right? No, I mean, isn't that kind of dumb? But you go to the cemetery, and it's beautiful. I mean, the grass is green, and the plots are well kept, usually, at least in Camarillo. But inside, they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. What, those shiny white gravestones? Yeah, that's what Jesus says. Robbery, self-indulgence at the very core. In fact, in Luke chapter 11, he says this, Now when he spoke, a Pharisee asked him to have lunch with him, and he went in and reclined at the table. Oh, this guy didn't know what he was getting into. And when the Pharisee saw it, he was surprised that he had not first ceremonially washed before the meal. But the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but inside of you you are full of robbery and wickedness. How does Jesus know that? He sees our hearts. He knows the filth that's there. You foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? Isn't that silly that Jesus has to remind them that there's something going on on the inside too and it's even more important to God? Verse 41, but give that which is within is charity and then all things are clean for you. Give your inner self to the business of helping the poor. Give your heart to righteousness. Give your heart to truth, not fakery and hypocrisy. See, that's what we need to be saved from right there, all of that. And praise God that he sent Jesus 
to rescue me and rescue you, just like I was able to say in my testimony this week. He came to rescue us from dead, external, man-centered, man-made religion. That means nothing. And he came to rescue us from wicked hearts that that false religion could not rescue us from. To give us new and clean hearts and heart-centered love and devotion to him as the Lord. Now, Luther had this right with characteristic, you know, he's like a James, but later in church history, just kind of lays it out there. Luther contrasts the external with the internal. He writes this, Christ wants to have the heart pure. Though outwardly the person may be a drudge in the kitchen, black, sooty, and grimy, doing all sorts of dirty work. And again, he says, though a common laborer, a shoemaker, or a blacksmith may be dirty and sooty, or may smell because he is covered with dirt and pitch, and though he stinks outwardly, inwardly he is pure incense before God. Isn't that beautiful? Why? Because God looks at the heart. We get all hung up on the externals. Christ wants to have the heart pure. That is God's concern. That is Christ's focus. So let's talk then about purity of heart, letter B, the meaning. What is purity of heart? What is it? Well, the Greek word here originally just simply meant clean. And it was used, for example, of soiled clothes that had been washed clean. I'm strange this way. I like to do laundry. I really do. I'm going to do some tomorrow. I like seeing the laundry come out clean. And our English word cathartic comes from this Greek word. A cathartic is an agent used by a doctor for a cleansing of the body system. Catharsis, we use that term in counseling for the cleansing of the mind or the emotions. But there is even more importantly a spiritual catharsis in which God cleanses us on the inside, the inner man. And in Acts 15, 9, Peter says of both Jews and Gentiles that God has cleansed our hearts in salvation by faith. That's how he did it. Faith in Christ, and he cleansed our hearts. 1 John 1, 7, the blood of God's Son cleanses us from all sin. Now, aren't you glad this morning that that's true about you? Aren't you glad? So this Greek word here, it has the meaning of clean, clean, simply clean. But then the second meaning, basic to the word pure, is also unmixed. Clean, unmixed. For example, it was used of corn after it was winnowed and sifted and cleansed of all the chaff. Pure corn. It's used of metals that are refined until all the impurities are removed. It's unmixed metal. All the dross is gone. Pure metal. It's also used commonly with another Greek adjective that would describe, for example, milk or wine that was unmixed, that was unadulterated with water. This word was used of an army with all the cowards and the discontented and the unwilling and the inefficient removing, uh, being removed, so that you have this this, uh, force consisting only of first-class soldiers. That's our word. Now, when you come to purity of heart, then, you're describing something much deeper and more significant. A a heart is pictured here that does not bring mixed motives and divided loyalties to your relationship to God. You get that? Here's the idea. Single-mindedness. Write that down. Single-mindedness. Undivided devotion. Tasker defines the pure in heart as, quote, the single-minded who are free from the tyranny of a divided self. Isn't that great? James refers to this idea when he confronts us in James 4.8. He says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. It's a sin to be double-minded. In James 1.8, the double-minded man, literally the two-souled man, That person, says James, is unstable in all of his ways. So purity of heart then refers to singleness of devotion to God. It's unmixed loyalty. It's undivided. And the background in the Old Testament for this sixth beatitude is Psalm 24. And I just want you to write that down so that you can do some study on your own later. Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4, I want to read it to you. The psalmist David says, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? The hill of the Lord, that's Mount Zion. The holy place, that's the temple in Jerusalem. Who can go into the presence of God? That's what he says. 
That's what he's asking. And here's his answer, verse 4 of Psalm 24. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. Clean hands, that's your actions of your life done with the hands. The pure heart is contrasted with falsehood and swearing deceitfully. So here's the idea. Purity equals sincerity. It equals a life free from falsehood. Toward God, it's a devotion that excludes idolatry and false gods. It's a single-mindedness. Toward man, no deceit. We speak the truth. No hypocrisy. No deceit. That's the pure heart. Clean, unmixed, single-minded, undivided loyalties. Are you like that toward the Lord this morning? That's what Jesus, our Lord, is talking about. Notice how Jesus confronts double-mindedness. Go back to Matthew chapter 6. Chapter 5, now jump ahead to Matthew chapter 6. In verse 24, he confronts this double-mindedness in our hearts. He says, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Isn't that interesting? That of all the idols he could have picked, he picks money because he knows what our hearts struggle with. He knows how our hearts turn to that idol. You cannot serve two masters. Are you trying this morning? Are you trying to do it? God and money, you can't love both, says Jesus, it's impossible. Or God plus any other idol. He's not going to share his throne. God plus fill in the blank. You know what it is in your life. I know what it is in my life. It'll never work. Repent of it. Right now, turn to the living God. Right now. And James puts the same truth in another way. In James chapter 4, verse 4, he says, You adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now, don't you miss who he's talking to, because that's crucial. James 4.4, I am convinced, is written to Christians. Now, why do I say that? Because, you see, non-Christians do not make friends with the world. They are the world. And they're part of the world system. This is written to Christians who are saved and separated out from the world and out from the world system. And further, non-Christians do not make themselves enemies of God. They are enemies of God already. So then, this is a very shocking thing to say to us this morning as Christians from James 4. To love the world. And it's not talking about the people that you're trying to reach for Christ. The world system, anti-God system, to pursue the sinful things of the world, says James, is to be guilty of spiritual adultery. He calls us, you adulteresses, a heart divided between the world and God, two loves. That's like a, a wife who has a husband and a boyfriend. That's impossible. That's, that's dishonoring to God. And it actually makes us, says James, enemies of God, opposed to God. Purity of heart means one commitment. It's mean, it means willing one thing, and that is full, complete, undivided devotion to God only, to Christ alone. It is Mark 12, 30, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Isn't that amazing? You know, God doesn't kind of make a deal with us. You know, just give me a little bit. I just want part of your heart. No. Love him with all your heart, not with a divided heart. That would be an impure heart. Purity of heart means an unmixed, sincere, single-minded devotion. No deception, no hypocrisy, no double-mindedness or divided allegiance. So how are you doing this morning with this issue of radical, and it is radical, you admit, Radical inner purity. I hope that this discussion is leading you right back to poverty of spirit and right back to mourning over sin and right back to hungering and thirsting after righteousness. I pray so. I pray the Beatitudes are gripping us and changing us from the inside out. I hope 
that we are humbled and we are broken and that we realize that when it comes to purity of heart, as in everything, you and I need God, don't we? We need God. In Matthew 19, after Jesus lets the rich man go away unsaved, the disciples say to Jesus, then who can be saved? And Jesus' answer, it's this, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. You can't do it. Man can't do it. And I say to you, whether it's salvation or sanctification, God is our only hope. He is our only hope. Look to him. It is impossible for you. And I do pray that God will humble us so we see ourselves rightly in our need for him. It's impossible to us. But God can do it. He is, praise him, the God of the impossible. So what do you do when you feel crushed by the Beatitudes, by the standard of God? Well, you trust in him and you lean on him only. And that means right now, tell him, tell him, God, I need you. I am desperate for you. I need you, God. We need him. The Sermon on the Mount keeps showing us this. But for the downcast, the humble, the poor in spirit, the dependent, the mourners, for those hungering and thirsting after righteousness, Jesus gives a promise. It is a spectacular promise. All of the Beatitudes lead up to this. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. First of all, I have good news for you this morning. It's a reminder. And that is when the Lord saved us, he cleansed our hearts and he gave us new pure hearts. Acts 15, 9 again. He cleansed our hearts by faith. He did it, but he did it all by himself. He, he merely transformed us when we put out the hand of faith to receive unearned salvation and clean hearts as a gift. In fact, in Ezekiel 36, Ezekiel describes what God does with all new covenant believers, Jews to whom the promises were given, and Gentiles because we get in on the blessings remarkably. And I want to read it to you again. Ezekiel 36, starting at verse 25. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. In other words, you and I, when God saved us, we were cleansed from all filthiness and idolatry, and we have now new and pure hearts, a, a heart transplant, a heart of stone removed, a heart of flesh put in, as well as God's Spirit now living in us and empowering us for this obedience that he's called us to. So salvation leads to sanctification. Initial purity of heart leads to continual purity of heart. Well, my question then is, are we passive in this process of day-by-day day heart transformation, continual and upward purification of heart? And the answer, of course, is no. No. But what God began, God sustains by his spirit. So don't lose heart. Yield to the spirit of God just this morning, now. What is impossible to us is possible to God. Now, is there an additional help that God gives us? Anything else that we can say about the connection between seeing God and purity of heart? And the answer is yes. And I got to read to you this morning. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. John says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. We were moved out of the world and into the family of God. Beloved, he says, now we are children of God. And it has not appeared as yet what we shall be. But, we can add, we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Now, here's the hope. 
John says, we are going to see Christ one day. It could be today. We've never seen him. I've never gone to heaven and I'm not writing novels about it. It never happened to me. Peter assumes that we haven't seen Christ. He says, though you haven't seen him, you love him. But one day we're going to see Christ and we're going to marvel and we're going to be finally fully changed when we see God, God the Son. And so, says John in verse 3, let that hope motivate you to purity. You see, the outlook determines the outcome, doesn't it? That's the connection. Future seeing of God leads me through that hope to increasing purity now. I I know I'm going to see him, and so I want to get ready now. God purifies us. We purify ourselves. Sanctification involves God and us. He works in us so that we will and work for his good pleasure, and you and I work out our salvation with fear and trembling but he has given us his spirit and he has given us this hope. We are going to see Jesus Christ. Now, wouldn't that be amazing? Could you imagine right in the middle of this sermon, we just see Jesus Christ. That is just a staggering hope. As surely as you see my face, you know, unfortunate you, we're going to see his face. We're going to look into the face of Jesus Christ. And we're going to marvel. That's why Philippians 1.21 is true. For me to live is Christ. And to die is gain, says Paul. I'm not afraid of death. I heard Ron Holting say that this morning. He was telling a, a guy he works with, I'm not afraid of death. Why? Why? Because to live is Christ and to die is gain. I know where I'm going. And I'm going to get more of Christ. And our hope in Philippians 3.20 20 and 21, heaven's not our home. We don't belong there. We're citizens of heaven. And we're filled with this hope that we eagerly await the coming of a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. What's he going to do? When you and I see him, we're going to be changed to be like him. I can't wait because this body of mine is creaking and groaning. And I want to trade it in. This body's not going to follow me to heaven. I'm so glad to tell you that. It's going to be replaced by a body just like Christ. And he's going to do it, we read in Philippians 3.21, by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Now, this is what Jesus promises us. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they, we, shall see God. Can you think of any more wonderful promise than that? That we're going to see God? That changes everything, doesn't it? We're going to see God. What's up next on the docket? I'm going to see God. What are you heading towards? The sight of God. If it'll help you, one thing that helped me think about heaven and my life on earth now is when I was at the Master's Seminary, I lived in Mariposa, I was doing the THM, and I was driving every week down from Mariposa to Los Angeles to classes, and then I'd drive back a couple days later. And I remember how eager every week I was. I couldn't wait to get home to see Donna. I couldn't wait to get home to see my kids. Nothing was going to keep me from getting home. The neighbor all the time would say, tell Paul, don't even try to get up that driveway. It's, you know, feet of snow. It didn't matter. If I had to take 15 passes up the driveway, I was going to make my own trail and get home to my wife and my kids. Now, what did I have to do down in L.A.? I had, to, I had a job to do, didn't I? Seminary. It had work. I had a calling. I had to get ready for it. I had to go back for another degree. Labor, good labor. Yet, I was eager every week to get back to my bride and my family. And if we could just think that way, we have work to do on this earth, right? Like Paul down in L.A. getting that THM. But we are going home. And there's this eagerness that then comes with it. I don't belong here. I'm working here. I'm on assignment from the Lord. But I can't wait to get home. I can't wait to see my Lord. Okay, I can endure the hard tasks. I can endure the difficulty. But I can't wait to see God. The thing that delights us, directs us. What a blessed hope. One last point, and then we're done. Letter D. I think I skipped letter C, but it's on your outlines. Can you show letter C, Leah? Now letter D. Notice the growth. How do I develop impurity of heart? Let's answer this, and then we'll be done. The sixth beatitude, 
describes us as Christians, people who, by God's grace in us, are pure in heart. People, I mean, just look around this room. People who are going to see God. That's who we're talking about. People in this room who know Jesus Christ, who are going to see God. That's amazing to me. But our text also challenges us and it encourages us to re-examine and refocus our hearts and to prize and to pursue what Jesus talks about here, purity of heart, to pursue it more than ever in our lives. So how do I mature in this area? Can you give me any help, Pastor Paul? Let's do this. Point number one first. How do we mature in this area? How do we grow here? Through prayer. Through prayer. We better say that. And this point has two parts. So point one, first through prayer, has a letter A. And this is what I want you to get. Letter A. Be absolutely honest with God about the true condition of your heart. Be absolutely honest with God about the true condition of your heart. Listen to Ivan Turgenev. Who in the world is Ivan Turgenev? He was a 19th century Russian novelist. He speaks for all of us like this. He writes, he says, I do not know what the heart of a bad man is like, but I do know what the heart of a good man is like, and it is terrible. The heart of a good man is terrible. How true. So be honest to God about your heart. Why be dishonest with God? He knows anyway. Why do we play games with God? Why do we try to hide from God? Be honest with him. Proverbs chapter 20 verse 9 says, who can say, I have cleansed my heart. I am pure from my sins. Can anybody say that this morning? I have cleansed my heart and I am pure from my sins. Anybody? No one, huh? I, didn't, I was hoping no one would raise a hand this morning. Ask God's Spirit to show you the exact status, the real state of your heart this morning. Is it clean? Is it pure? Is it focused on God? Is it eager to see God? Your heart, whatever you see there, whatever God reveals, pray it back to Him with honesty and integrity. No games, no hiding, just truth. Confess that impurity back to Him. And grab hold of 1 John 1, 9. Once again, if we confess our sins, if we say the same thing about them as God does, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's letter A under prayer. Here's letter B. Acknowledge to God that only he can make your heart pure. Acknowledge that to God that only he can make your heart pure. So then here's our prayer as a result. It comes from David. It comes from a man after God's own heart, and this is what he says. He says in Psalm 51.10, here's our prayer, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. If the Beatitudes break us so that we're praying like that, that will glorify our Lord. Psalm 51, 6 and 7, Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. So David says, Purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. God created me a clean, a pure heart. Cast yourself this morning on the grace of God and beg Him, utterly dependent. Pray for Him to bring radical renewal the character of Christ, the character of the kingdom of God in you. Now, how else do I mature in this area of purity of heart? Secondly, through a serious commitment to purity in your life. A serious commitment. How serious is this? It is so serious that the writer of Hebrews in chapter 12, verse 14 says this, pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Now Jesus says the pure of heart will see God and the writer of Hebrews says if there is no sanctification, you won't see God. Remember, the pure in heart see him but without holiness, without Christ-likeness, no one will see the Lord. 
One writer said it like this, those who delight in the pure are the only ones who will find pure delight. That's exactly right. So pursue sanctification and holiness and purity and commit to it. Shun unholiness. Shun impurity. I don't know what those distractions are in your life. Whatever the form may be, I don't know in your life. God knows. You know better than I what those are. Shun them and pursue purity and holiness. And then lastly, how else do I mature in this area of purity of heart? Through filling yourself with God's word. That's where we end this morning. Through filling yourself with God's word. Hebrews 4.12, that living, active word, that word that is all edge, sharper than any two-edged sword. It is alive. It will show you as you truly are. It will judge all the way down to the very thoughts and intentions of your heart. But not only will it reprove you, not only will it expose sin, but also as we know that living word will correct you and will train you in righteousness. It will not just teach you, it will enable you and empower you for purity. So fill yourself with God's word. Amen? Let's pray this morning. Father, thank you for making your blessed way clear through your son, Jesus. It is a way of humility. It is a way of brokenness. It is a way of confession of sins. It is a way of gentleness and mercy. It is a way of hungering and thirsting after righteousness. It is a way of purity of heart. On the one hand, Lord, we're delighted at the promise that one day we're going to see you. And simultaneously, we confess to you the impurity of our hearts the lack of single-mindedness, the distractions, the idolatry, the worldliness, the lack of love. We need you to continue your good work in our hearts. So, Lord, please create in us pure hearts as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen.